Hello everyone. Uh, today I'm going to talk about Vitalik covering theorem uh, as my, for my presentation for the measure theory course. Um, first, I'd like to give an intuitive idea about the statement of the theorem. So let's try to paint a picture about what it says roughly. So given a sufficiently large collection of sets that cover some set E, here uh, we're going to define properly what this sufficiently large means. For now, uh, let's think of a large cover. Uh, the Vitali theorem selects a disjoint subcollection that covers almost all of E. All right, let's try to understand. So we're given a suitable large cover or a set E. And in our context, we're gonna be working in RN and we're gonna be using Hausdorff measures. So in our context, E will be a subset of Rn, and we are given a very large cover uh, for E. The Vitali theorem allows us to select a subcover to extract a countable subcollection, uh, such that this subcollection will be consisting of disjoint elements, and they will almost cover E, which means in measure theory terms we're familiar with, the difference between E and the union of the disjoint elements from our subcollection will have measure zero. All right, so let's start with our uh, definitions. First, a delta cover. Uh, first, of course, sorry, the diameter of U. Since we are in Rn, uh, we define the diameter of U as the supremum uh, of the distance between any two points in the set U. And for a delta cover, naturally the set E must be included in the union of our cover and uh, our elements in the cover UIs must have a positive diameter and their diameter should be smaller than delta since this is a delta cover. And now I'm gonna give a definition of Hausdorff, S-dimensional Hausdorff outer measure because this is a slightly different definition than we've talked about in the class. Uh, this is the definition that book uses, and I'm going to be uh, using this definition in the following lemmas and proofs as well. So let's see how it's different. It's almost the same. It's just missing the calibrating term, the uh, alpha over 2i term we were talking about in the class. All right, so first this thing. So this is uh, Hausdorff, well, this is the infimum over delta covers. So UIs here are delta covers, and we're taking the infimum over delta covers, and we're looking at the uh, sum of the S power of the diameters of UIs. And we're taking the supremum over deltas afterwards to define the house of outer measure, as dimensional house of outer measure. It's almost the same, just missing that small calibrating term. All right, our first number. So let's dive into it. Let E be a finite, uh, let E be a house of measurable set with finite measure. So given epsilon positive, then we can find a row positive depending only on E and epsilon, such that for any collection of Borel sets, uh, row Borel sets, if you will, we can say, I guess, uh, whose diameters are non-zero and smaller than rho, we would have this uh, inequality. The Hausdorff measure of E intersection union of these UIs, these Borel sets, will be smaller than the sum of the uh, S powers of the diameters of UIs plus epsilon. All right, let's go to the proof. So remember that, 8s is the supremum of these guys, these infimums. So uh, we may choose a row such that this inequality holds. The reason is this is the supremum of these infimums, these numbers, let's say. So this is a supremum of these numbers. So when uh, an epsilon is given in the epsilon neighborhood of the supremum, there is always such a number. So this inequality holds. And since uh, these are infimums over row covers, given any row cover, since this is infimum of all of those things, 
this inequality also holds because this is the infimum of such row covers, uh, such sums of the S power of the diameter of row covers. All right. So given any UI, any Borel sets UI with this property, we may find a row cover uh, of this set, uh, E minus union of UIs, such that this inequality holds. And let's understand what this inequality says. First, again, because this is a supremum, this is always larger than this, because this is the supremum of such guys over rho. So naturally, this will always be larger than this, or larger or equal. Yes. Sorry about that. It should be larger or equal. And then, uh, let's see. So this is an infimum. So uh, infimum of row covers. So when we add an epsilon here, it will be always larger than, uh, we can always find a row cover bi such that this inequality holds because this is an infimum and uh, in the epsilon neighborhood of infimum, we can always find a row cover like this because this is also uh, infimum of row covers. We're not taking the infimum over, the infimum or supremum over row in this step. This is the infimum of the row covers. So in the absolute neighborhood of infimum of the row covers, we can always find a row cover that satisfies this inequality. All right, since the i's uh, are a row cover of e minus union of ui's and ui's are a cover of ui's, when we uh, combine them together, the collection of all of these sets is a cover for E. It's a row cover for E because UIs are also uh, have this property. The I's are already a row cover. So the collection of this is a row cover of E. Then I'm gonna use this inequality at our next step. Since this collection, uh, collection of UIs and VIs is a row cover of E, this inequality holds when we write it for UIs and BIs, just like this. And since uh, E has finite measure, we can write E like uh, E intersection union of UIs like this, because of it's a measure. And then the rest is simply plugging in the identities we have found so far. For uh, measure of of measure of E, we have this identity. We plug in this one, and for this one, uh, E difference union of UIs, we have this identity. This guy is larger than this one. So if I plug in it, we have this. So things cancel, and we're left with this. So this is the desired inequality because this is what our lemma states anyway. So we've done with the lemma, we've proved it. All right, now let's define what we meant uh, by sufficiently large in the beginning. So uh, this is something called a Vitali class. So a collection of sets, subscript V, is called a Vitali class for E if for each X in E, and for any delta positive, there exists a U in subscript B with X in U and uh, the diameter of U is positive, not, it cannot be zero, it must be positive, we're not in, interested in singletons, and the diameter of U is smaller than delta. Let's give a quick example about uh, Vitali classes because uh, I want to mention uh, something simple. So here I've I've written two examples. First, if the set we want to cover is finite, then we have a we can have a Vitali class like this. The reason is one over two i's go to zero. So when the ball is based on zero and the only element of our set E is zero, the singleton, then for zero, given any delta, we can find a small enough ball whose diameter is smaller than delta. But even if the set is uncountable, far larger than a singleton. So we can still find a countable Vitali class because we know that our rational numbers are dense in real numbers. Therefore, if we pick uh, our center 
and our radius from rational numbers, so our Vitalik class would be countable, even though our set is uncountable. So when we say sufficiently large, when we talk about Vitalik classes, it can be a small class of sets as well. So it could be countable. I just want to point that out. All right. So let's continue with our main theorem we want to prove, Vitalik covering theorem. Let E be an a uh, Hausdorff measurable subset of Rn, and let subscript B be a Vitalik class of closed sets for E. Then we may select a finite or countable disjoint sequence Ui from subscript B, such that either the sum of the S power of the diameter of the Uis uh, is infinite, or the difference between E and the union of Uis has measure zero. In addition, if we have uh, that uh, set's measure is finite, then given any epsilon, we may also have this inequality. I may, I mean, we have also this inequality. All right, let's go to the proof of the theorem. So first, uh, we can fix rho. Uh, and bound all of our Vitalis sets. But there are two reasons. We're not interested in extremely large sets, for instance. I mean, rho could be technically anything because uh, since it's a Vitalis class, uh, we can always such a we can always find such a u for any x such that x is in u, uh, and diameter of u could be smaller than rho, and it will be positive as well. So there is such a u in Vitalis class. So without loss of generality, we can assume that to begin with. So uh, to find a sequence of U's, we uh, do a process inductively. What we do is, initially we choose a random U1. It could be any member of the Vitalik class, but then uh, we define this thing D1 as the supremum. So essentially what we want is, we want to construct a sequence that is consisting of disjoint elements, and uh, sequence elements should have some properties with its diameter so that we can play with their geometry a little bit. All right, so we define the one to be the supremum of diameters of u such that u intersection, our first pick u1 is empty and it's in the Vitali class. Afterwards, we pick our second element depending on the one and our first u1. So our second element will naturally be in the Vitalik class, but we want it to be disjoint with U2, and we want its diameter to be larger than half of D1. So we can ask if such a U2 exists, of course. It may not, because once we pick U1, D1 might be zero. There may not be any other U that intersects U1 in which case our process terminates at that step and we would have a sequence with one element, U1. But then uh, we will come to that soon. In that case, our statement is still true if we're gonna prove it as a claim. All right, we pick our sequence elements like that. So D3 will be uh, depending on, uh, U3 will be depending on D3 where uh, D2, where D2 will be the supremum of uh, diameters of U, where U will be in our Vitalik class again, but U intersection U1 union U2 will be empty this time. And then we want U3 to be disjoint with U1 and U2, and diameter of U3 will be larger than half of D2, the supremum of such elements. Again, uh, if D2 is zero, same problem, but we're gonna to come to that right about now. Let's say we could pick M uh, elements for our sequence and at the M step, the M is zero. So our sequence terminates at that step. But then I claim uh, our set E is a subset of the union of UIs. So let's prove this claim. So let's assume uh, the uh, commerce of this statement. So uh, let's assume there is such an X in E difference union of UIs. 
then uh, since we uh, we picked a Vitali class of closed sets, uh, we're going to use the topology of UIs. So since this is a Vitali class, for each delta i, we can pick delta i to be 1 over 2i. There exists a u delta i uh, subscript b, such that x is in u delta i, and the diameter of u delta i is smaller than delta i, which is 1 over 2i. And it will be positive, because if you recall, uh, in Vitali class, diameter of ui is positive. So, all right. We could find such a u delta i uh, for each delta i for our x, because of it. it's a Vitali class. Uh, one important note is that if our sequence terminates at the nth step, it means the n is 0, which means supremum of Use in the Vitali class uh, that do not intersect our first m elements is zero, which means every u intersects our union of uis, because the supremum of u's that do not intersect them is zero, which means u delta i, whatever delta i is, intersected with our union has non-empty intersection, which means for each delta i, I can pick an xi in this intersection. This xi will be both in our u delta i, but also in our union of uj's here. But as i goes to infinity, delta i clearly goes to zero, which means diameter of u delta i's go to zero. But each u delta i, whatever i is, contains x as well, which means these xi's converge to x as i goes to infinity. But since uh, xi's are also in this union, and right now we're going to use the topology of closed sets, I claim that x must also be in this union because this is a union of finitely many closed sets. But in closed sets, in real numbers, uh, if a sequence of elements has a limit, closed set must contain the limit as well, which means x must be in the union as well. And this is a contradiction because we picked x from this set. It's in the complement of the union. So there's a contradiction. This means there is no such x. But then E is uh, a subset of our union, which actually proves our statement for this case. Because if E is, in, e is a subset of this union, it means uh, E subtract this union is actually empty set, and for any measure, empty sets measure is zero. So we're done in this case. So uh, since we cleared this case, let's move to the case where it does not terminate. So the process continues indefinitely. Then again, we want to either prove that this sum is infinite or the Hausdorff measure of this set is zero. So let's say this sum is finite. Then we want to show Hausdorff measure is zero, because if we can show it, then we're done with the first part of our theorem. Now, for each i, i of ui, we pick a ball uh, whose center is in ui, with radius three times the diameter of ui. And then we claim that uh, e difference uh, union of ui from one to k is a subset of union uh, of bi's from k plus 1 to infinity. So first, let x be in this side. Let's, let x be in e minus uh, union of ui's from 1 to k. So then there exists a u that does not intersect any of these guys. The reason is, if there was not a u such that it it does not intersect any of these elements, it means uh, our sequence would terminate at a k plus one step. So it would be a finite sequence, and we would be returning to this part. And then we would be done again. But we assumed it continues indefinitely, so such a u exists. And from here, we can see that uh, diameters of ui as i goes to infinity go to zero because of 
basic calculus, the uh, general term must go to zero because this is a finite series. And if it's S power is going to zero, then it goes to zero as well. This means for a large enough M, I can, uh, I can make sure that this inequality holds. Since we picked our U that does not intersect our first K elements in this sequence, uh, I can pick such a large M that this holds because the diameter of UIs go to zero as I goes to infinity. And by the construction of UI, you must intersect uh, some UI where I is between K and M. First, I does not, I has to be larger than K because U does not intersect first K elements. And then uh, if it doesn't intersect any of the first M elements, it means, uh, it means there's a contradiction because the diameter of uh, U is larger than two times the diameter of UM, but we pick the diameter of UM to be larger than one over two times the N minus one. So if it doesn't intersect first M minus one elements, it means there's a contradiction because this is uh, the M minus one is the supremum of the sets in subscript B that are disjoint with first M minus one element. If U is not disjoint with the first M minus one elements, then uh, its diameter cannot be larger than the supremum of those elements. So that would be a contradiction. So it must intersect with one uh, of UIs where I is between K and M. But recall how we constructed BIs because uh, BIs are large balls centered at one element in UI with the radius three times the diameter of UI. So since uh, U must intersect with UI for which this inequality holds, because, uh, because the way we chose the diameters of UIs. Uh, by Euclidean geometry, U is in uh, the ball BI, because BI has three times the radius of, uh, three times the diameter of UIs. So it's a very large ball, it contains UI, and since U has this diameter, smaller than two times the diameter of UI, it must sit in one of those BIs. So, uh, for any delta positive at this point, we have this inequality. This is true because um, this set is larger than this set. I mean, this, this set uh, is contained in this set because we're not uh, subtracting all of the UIs. We're stopping at the k, so naturally, uh, this inequality holds. For here, though, uh, because uh, we are, so this number, uh, this is just the infimum over the row covers, row covers of this set. So if we pick K large enough, uh, what we have is since uh, UIs go to zero, uh, UKs will be uh, small enough such that three times diameter of UI will be small enough. So diameter of BIs will be smaller than delta. If we pick K large enough, we can ensure this. And then uh, since this is the infimum, this holds because when K is large enough, these balls become row covers, um, sorry, delta covers in our case. Uh, and because these are delta covers, uh, they're larger than the infimum of the delta covers. So this inequality holds. And since we pick their radius to be three times uh, the diameter of UIs, this equality is naturally holds. It holds. <laughs> so anyway, but this is true for any delta. And for arbitrary k, arbitrary large k, large enough k's. So we can send k to infinity, and then this side would go to zero because this is a finite sum. And this is the, uh, this is as k goes to infinity, this side goes to zero. So it means that for any delta, this infimum is zero. But then, 
since this is true for every delta, even if we take the supremum over deltas, it would still be zero. So the house of measure would be zero. And this part uh, proves our first part of the theorem. For the second part, we're gonna use our lemma. So let's return to first, uh, let's prove the easy part and then uh, let's return to our lemma for a second. This is lemma one, there's only a single lemma at this part. So this is a typo, sorry about that. So let's, um, let's prove the case where this is infinite first. If this is infinite, we are done automatically because the theorem states this inequality, but then if this part is infinite, since this is finite, the inequality holds anyway. Even if it was infinite, it would still hold, but it's finite in our case, so inequality holds. But if it's not infinite, then our, in our first part, we have proved that if this sum is finite, then the measure of E minus uh, union of UIs is zero. So we're gonna use that. That's our first, uh, first information. And the second will come from our lemma. If we recall, uh, given any epsilon positive, uh, we could find a row depending only on E and the epsilon, we could find, uh, for any Borel set, we could find such a row that this inequality holds. And here, we are given an epsilon, we are given an E. According to these two uh, variables, we can pick a row such that this guy is smaller than this guy. All right, now, we assume that this is finite. Because this is finite, at the first part, we prove that this is this measure is zero. And since E has finite measure, we can write it like this. And since this is zero, uh, we got a zero here. All we want to show is this part is smaller than this part. But we know it from the lemma because according to lemma, we could find a row which at first part we picked, we fixed it, but now we are choosing our row according to our uh, epsilon and E. So uh, we picked such a row and then this inequality holds because of our lemma. And that's all what we want to show because then this inequality also holds. So this concludes our theorem. So if you, uh, all right. So here are the references I mostly use for uh, this presentation, but I mainly use the first reference, Faulkner, the geometry of fractal sets. And that concludes my presentation. Um, thank you for your attention. Have a good day, stay safe.